Uh, so, hello, my name is Liam. Um, I am not actually an iOS or Apple dev. I am an interloper. Um, and I promise I will leave immediately after this. I'm actually a game developer. Um, so I make video games, and I run Australia's uh, game development conference. Uh, and I run a convention in Sydney called uh, GX Australia, which is uh, for a queer and diversity-focused gaming convention, uh, which is a lot of fun and a huge pain in the ass to put together. And it's, it's an amazing time all around. But, uh, one of the things that I have done over the last few years um, is I've worked as a, an indie developer. I've worked for publishers. Um, I've, I used to work in software. Um, and over that period of time, um, I've spent a lot of time helping small teams put projects together and helping people sort of help get their shit done. Um, so although this talk is labeled uh, The Long Road to Finishing Short projects, producing yourself. The alternative title is actually how to get shit done without losing it. Um, so yeah, hi. Um, I'm Liam. I'm a writer producer for games. Uh, I write content, I do narrative, um, and I'm that asshole that tells you that you're not working fast enough and you should probably finish by the deadline. Um, and the TLDR of this talk, I'm just going to do it like right up front, obviously, is just get it done. That's pretty basic. And the key word for this talk is short. So uh, pretty much everything that I am saying is applicable to pretty much any project. But um, I'm specifically talking about sort of uh, small scale, shorter projects. Um, hopefully, you know everything in this talk. Um, and I hope that this is just a refresher for you. That's like the ideal situation. So we have a bit of a question. Why should we do short projects, especially side projects? Um, and it's an excellent question. And far more intelligent people than me have uh, sort of answered it. And I'm not going to go into it today. But my, well, apart from the fact that my reasons are I do a lot of cool stuff during the day that's of a very specific nature. And at times, I like to come home and do something totally different to reset my brain and make sure that I'm not completely burning myself out, which I have a tendency to do. Um, so in this talk, we are going to talk about decision making, risk analysis, scoping, milestones, accountability, motivation. Um, and uh, the reality is that talks on production really suck. Like, they're the worst. Um, so uh, I do this one a little bit differently. Um, I wrote this talk last year, the initial version, while very drunk. Um, and I <laughs> had actually forgotten that I had a talk to give the next day, and so I got home very drunk and was like, okay, I need to get this done. Um, how do I make production interesting? Uh, this is kind of what resulted. And it was a lot of fun, um, especially because at the time, it was as new to me as it was to my audience. Um, and so there's a little bit of that today. I've tried, like when I've been revising the slides, I've been trying not to look at them too much. So. We are going to experience this together a little bit. And I hope that it's funny and useful to you. So in order to tell you about production, I'm going to introduce a cast of characters. I've got some, some helpers here to, who all have different short projects that they're having problems with. Um, hopefully, you recognize all of them. Uh, they're all uh, very well known. Uh, the first one is Miss Piggy. Uh, who's making a chat protocol that interfaces with toilets. Um, she's all about disrupting industry. And uh, she's, she's, she's really like, she, she's all about social justice. She wants to make the world a better place. And she's chosen toilets as the way to do that. Good for her. Um, the next character in our menagerie is Thomas the Tank Engine, of course, um, who's fallen off the rails while making his Git visualizer. He, um, he <laughs> There are so many different ways he can do this. He doesn't know where to start. Um, he's having a bit of a decision problem. And then, of course, naturally, we've got Sauron, um, who's trying to make a lifestyle app. And he's finding that he, uh, his constant overriding desire to invade Middle Earth and conquer it is, is really at odds with his desire to, to produce a product. Um, and it's, it's becoming actually quite problematic for him. And finally, again, naturally, we've got Lady Gaga, who's actually working on a VR dress for the VMAs. And when I wrote this talk, the VMAs hadn't happened yet. Um, they were actually last week. So let's like pretend that this is two weeks ago. 
Um, it turns out that uh, everyone else has got all of their VR addresses ready. Like this is the new thing at the VMAs. This is a highly technical, complicated process that Lady Gaga has decided, you know, she likes to get in the mud. She likes to do it herself. So she's doing this entire project and uh, she is producing it herself. So to begin with, we're going to talk a little bit about scope. Um, scope is a particularly interesting part of small projects, as you can imagine. It's very easy to overscope, underscope, uh, and you deal with fantastic amounts of scope creep. Um, it's always very exciting to see the project that you originally envisioned and then three months later go, oh my god, what has happened? What is this monster that I've created and how will it possibly get to market? Um, and this is the problem that Miss Piggy is having. So she came, keeps coming up with revolutionary new toilet interfacing concepts uh, that are forever going to disrupt the toilet industry, apparently. So uh, obviously, this is a huge problem. This is classic scope creep. Um, we've all been there with projects. I know that uh, all, most of the projects that I've worked on are games related. Um, so when I was working on uh, Baldur's Gate Siege of Dragonspear, which came out earlier this year, um, we had massive problems because all the team, like Baldur's Gate is a really popular series and we're all huge fans and we all had like amazing ideas for things that we wanted to do and we all were trying to do them at the same time as getting everything else done and, and the scope just ballooned. Um, and at the time we were trying to work out ways that we could manage the scope for Siege of Dragonspear. And um, I always have a bunch of projects on the go apart from my work. Um, and realized very quickly that there were a surprising amount of parallels between what I was doing at work and the incredible amount of scope creep that had occurred in my own projects. Um, so as I discovered, learning to decide on and stick to scope is really difficult. Um, it's something that we all encounter. It's something that we see every day in almost every project we do. And scope creeps insidious and kind of unavoidable. It's, it's really difficult when you're working on a project to just sort of sit there and uh, be like, yes, I am going to like, design this I, like, exactly like I did the original like, design document. Everything is going to be perfect. It's going to perfectly line up with my original vision. Because we constantly come up with new improvements, new ideas, better ideas. Um, and this is where, um, who's, and in games we call this pre-production. Who actually does pre-production on their either personal projects or small projects? Yes. Yeah. So even actually I find for small projects, pre-production is probably the most important part of this process. And it includes the process of prototyping and uh, getting your sort of what getting a real vision for what you're trying to do. Um, so the idea is that we want to use pre-production as the period to iterate and prototype rather than production itself, which should be about finishing the product. So getting a product to a, like an MVP finish state that you're happy with. Um, and <laughs> in games, this means you know, we have to get together a, a concept artist, uh, a, a designer, usually a narrative designer, a programmer, um, an audio engineer, um, and hopefully marketing as well, if we've got them on hand, um, to come in and start sort of sitting down and knocking out this work. Um, Pre-production is the time when you want to be locking down things. So this is a time that you get to experiment and play and have fun. And it should be an experience of playing. Like you're creating, it should be, you're, you're trying to create something awesome. You're trying to create something that's fun to use, that, that you find enjoyable. You want your project to be enjoyable. This is the fun bit, and you should treat it that way. Um, and then, uh, you separate that from production, where scope is locked. So pre-production is the time where you get to have fun, and it's great, and you're like knocking out all these cool improvements and ideas. Um, and when you get to the end of pre-production, you want to make a series of decisions about exactly how your like, V1, or V01, if that's what you want to do, is going to look like. Um, you want to be very, very specific, because uh, if you want to get things done and it's not something you have a lot of experience with, if you, if you often experience failure um, in trying to get your short projects done, um, this, this is where most likely it's happening. It's, it's in this period where like, you're still trying to iterate on the, on the prototype, you're still trying to get stuff done, and you're still trying to ship it. Um, 
And that's, that is a dangerous cycle that continues forever if you don't take control of it. So <laughs> Miss Piggy has a problem where, you know, she, she's coming up with so many cool ideas uh, for innovating the toilet industry through, you know, chat protocols, you know, fridge protocols, lighting protocols. Um, she, she wants to disrupt all the things. And, and, I, and I totally understand disruption is an attractive thing. Um, the first thing that I would say to Miss Piggy, of course, is that there is no secret to this process. You just got to do it and it sucks, and that's the reality. Um, and learning not to change until a set point is actually very, very difficult. We've all tried to stick to a design document and failed because like, we look at it and we're like, oh, like, but I wrote that two weeks ago, and I know now that I could do it better. That's fine. I'm sure you can do it better, but if you actually want to get something done, it is faster to just do your original idea, because then you're not going back and back and back and back and back, which is the pattern that you're establishing for yourself. And when I've talked to people about this before, this is often people's response. Um, my original idea that I prototyped and put together and then locked down is like I look back at it and it's shit. It's terrible. Um, like I'm not doing my beautiful, beautiful idea justice. Like this fantastic idea in my head. Uh, like I'm looking at it and it's this ugly concrete baby and it's, <laughs> it's deformed and I don't understand, it's crying and it, I can't get it to eat and I don't know what to do with it. And that is the reality of lockdown. Um, you will create an ugly screaming concrete baby that nobody loves um, and that's totally okay as long as you love it because really what's more important than a parent's love? Um, the reality is nothing's perfect. Nothing is perfect. Nothing is ever perfect. Um, all we can try to do is get something out the door, then we can play with it. Finishing is more important than perfection. Um, it's more important to get shit done than it is to create the perfect product, project, idea. Of course, <laughs> you still want to iterate. Like, it's been six months since you started this project and it's now so much better in your head. Like you've come up with all these amazing ideas. You know how to make your shitty product into something that's gonna be successful in the market. And improvements must be made. <laughs> Write your ideas in a file and set it aside. <laughs> this is a shitty thing to, fit, to do and it's, it's, it's not fun and it's not motivating by any stretch of the imagination. But if you can get all the ideas that you're having throughout the process and put them in a file, um, date it, make sure that you write exactly what your idea is, when you had it, why you had it, where you had it, all these things are very helpful later down the track. Um, it gives you time to actually think about them and they sit in the, you know, the compost of your subconscious and establish roots. And then by the time you sort of get to a, 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 an MVP, that maybe is shit, but still is something you could ship, um, you can then go back to all of your ideas and kind of rationally really look at them for what they are. Um, what will be successful? Now that you've got this thing, you've worked with it for so long and you hate it, um, what's realistically gonna make it better? And some, but sometimes you have projects that do have distinct parts. Um, for example, Miss Piggy's toilet chat interfacing protocol uh, obviously has several components. There's uh, probably the need to source a toilet that can receive a chat protocol. Um, there's creating the chat protocol itself. Um, there's probably some networky stuff. I'm not a technical person. You guys are much better at this than I am. Um, so I'll let you imagine for your own toilet chat protocol what the requirements might be. Um, but it's short, it's not tiny. There are multiple parts of this. And this is where milestones come in. Um, it's really important for motivation, which I will talk about later as well, but it's really important to start thinking about how you're gonna split up your project into manageable, manageable chunks that you can do. And this is part of the pre-production process. It's starting to think through, okay, well, to iterate to this point, to get to this prototype, 
Um, I know that X feature took me X amount of time to do. I know that this asset took me Y amount to do. And you should probably be recording all of this as you go. Um, then when you kind of get to production, you have a rough idea of how much time each of these individual things is likely to take. Um, you can uh, plan it out, kind of, somewhat, not really realistically. And it will be a slightly better approximation than you otherwise would have had. Um, and so you want to split those into milestones that are manageable and reasonable, and you can complete and tick, and that's fantastic. Then once you've got an MVP, you know, something you feel like you could release, even if it's really fucking shitty, um, you can then iterate on it, and you can add all of those cool features. But you want to make sure that you actually get something first. And to quote a famous poet, historian, and shoe manufacturer, just do it. <laughs> so. Miss Piggy, uh, she has to finish her toilet chat protocol before moving on to like poop track and know your pee, which are her new next ideas that she wants to then connect to uh, her toilet chat protocol. Um, well done, Miss Piggy, well done. The next part of this is decision making. Um, arguably, I mean, all of these are arguably the most important parts of thinking about production. Decision making is definitely one of the top five. Um, top 10, top 20, arguably. So, Thomas has so many different ways that he could do his project. Um, there are so many different tracks he could go down. Oh. <laughs> I will not apologize. <laughs> Drunk Liam thinks he's very funny. <laughs> Sober Liam less so, but you know, I'm just going to go with it. Um, for someone like Thomas, where you're facing essentially decision paralysis, um, you need to find a way to think about all the various pathways or um, parts of the project in a different light, and you need to then evaluate each of them. And the way, one way to do this is through risk analysis. Risk analysis is a really key part of short projects in particular, and long projects, and pretty much anything in your life, um, that you know, we don't think about day to day. Like, especially if it's a thing that you're doing in your part time, um, you're not going to be like, oh, what's the highest element of risk in this mod for this game? Or like, what's the highest element of risk in this app I'm creating in my spare time to help save toilets from radiation? Um, how do you do this? And I mean, the biggest risks that you have are always going to be unknowns. They're stuff that you don't know that you don't know, essentially. Um, so let's talk about this a little bit. There are three types of knowledge. There's Actually, there's four. But for the purposes of this, we're going to ignore the other one, because fuck it, this is my talk, and we're going to do it my way. There are things you know. There are things you know you don't know. And there are things that you don't know that you don't know. If I was going to rate these from top to bottom, like in terms of what's least dangerous to most dangerous, it is exactly this. Unknown unknowns are dangerous, and they are unavoidable, and they will blindside you at 2 AM when you're committing to Git, and suddenly someone's called you on the phone being like, the servers have just gone down, everything's fucked, everything's on fire, we're, everything's gone, ah. Yeah, there's no way that you could have known that an Iranian hacker had decided to, you know, come into your system and inject some code and, and just create havoc. Um, so there's nothing you can do really about that apart from have better security, um, which you should all have. Um, but if you want to reduce your risk, you can look at your known unknown. So the things that you know that you don't know in any project. Um, for example, uh, when I started to manage events, um, I knew nothing <laughs> apart from like I'd thrown a few parties. I was like, I can do this. I've thrown dinner parties. I've done birthday parties. I've cooked cakes. I've baked. This isn't that hard. You know, it's all, it's all scale, right? It's like 20 people, 50 people, 500 people. Like it's all the same. It's fine. Um, of course, <laughs> that's not true at all. Um, there, while there are economies of scale in this case, most of them are unfavorable. Um, and uh, so I had to very rapidly sort of learn how this worked, um, much like Thomas is doing right this minute. 
So for me, in that situation, I knew how to like lock down a venue. I kind of had an idea of how like a like call for submissions or call for papers worked. I've submitted talks to conferences. I've never had to run that part of the process, but I had a vague understanding. Um, and I had plenty of friends I could invite down as speakers, right? Like, that's fine. Um, that's, that's how I'm going to get my keynotes. I'll get all of my famous friends to come down. Um, I knew that I didn't know yeah, how to do a bunch of that and was able to like write down a list. I was like, here are the things that I think I know. Here are the things that I know I don't know. Um, and then there's this like silent third column of horror that we try not to think about too hard. Um, and the way that the reason we do this is because we can use risk to help make decisions. Um, so in the first version of this talk, these were all games. And so the notes that I have are still for the games. <laughs> so let's pretend instead that Thomas has three projects that he's working on, um, or three, three different things, that he, three different tracks he can go down. He's got a side scroller in Unity, a shoot 'em up in Unity, and a limited open world FPS in Unreal. How can he look at the risk factors in these different projects to help him make a decision? So uh, he is very familiar with the side scroller genre. He's played a lot of them. He's pretty sure he can replicate the mechanics. And he's pretty cool. He's, he's got some ideas to innovate on them. Um, his knowledge of Unity is so-so. Like, it's fine. He could probably make this game, and it would be a big process for him. But you know, whatever. Um, Shoot 'em ups, sure. He's played a few. Um, he just has a really cool like visual that he he's got in his head for this game that he wants to work on. Um, but he's not an artist, so there's a bit of a risk there. Um, it's in Unity. He's okay with Unity. That's fine. Um, then he's got his limited open world FPS. Um, a, an o any open world game is insane. Like it's just insane. There's no way one person could ever do a project like that. Um, and also, he doesn't really know Unreal that well. He's probably opened it three times and closed it. Um, so if we're going to look at like, the different uh, levels of risk in these projects based on his knowledge and knowledge of the genres and mechanics, et cetera, we'd say that the side scroller is probably the strongest case. It has the least risk involved. A shoot 'em up has some risk, but m more essentially. And then a limited open world FPS is definitely out of the picture. Um, so we picked a side scroller based on the fact that there's the least risk of failure. And sometimes we just have three options that are very similar that we aren't sure what to do with. They're, it's hard to sometimes pick when you're doing things that you care about and you really want to do all of them. Um, and this is the kind of the point where you just sort of have to tell yourself to get a fucking grip um, and realize that deciding something makes it right. Decide making a decision makes it the right decision. Whether or not in the end it is at that point in time, making a decision is the right thing to do. So whatever you decide is the right thing to do. And decisions aren't immutable. You can always go back. And as Thomas says, <laughs> If something goes horribly wrong with your decision, like you, you go partway through the project and you realize, oh my god, I should have done this in Unreal or whatever. Um, how, do I, how do I handle this? Um, it's fine because you can pivot. No decision is permanent. It's all OK. Don't panic. Um, the important thing to remember is that making a decision does make it right. It makes it the right thing to do by virtue of the fact that you're choosing it. And if you look back at your life, a lot of the time you'll probably find that the decision that you made may not have had clear um, risk. Like you didn't know what was more risky at the time and you picked a decision and it ended up being the right one because that was the one that you picked. Well done, yay. <laughs> but what happens if you're just kind of over it. You've been working on a project for six months. This was meant to be a three-month project. What do you do then? And this is, this is Sauron's problem. Like He keeps starting new projects. He can't help himself. Um, he's, got a, he's, he's got a real problem. He's now on his 10th like, project that he's started. He's never finished anything. He can't even finish invading Middle-earth. I mean, really. 
So you need to look at the behavior, your own behavioral patterns here. You need to look at your own psychology and the way you behave. So in order to do that, you kind of have to have a little bit of self-perception and self-understanding and be prepared to admit that you have faults. Of course, I have none, but you all have faults. So that's fine. Um, trying to take over Middle Earth is really way more fun than programming at the end of the day too. Like, who wants to program when you can go and you can take over a small village of hobbits and slaughter them? Like, that just sounds so enticing. I don't know about you all, but this is what Sauron's into. And so we have to ask him, hey, why can't you finish these projects? And in order to, to find the answer to this, we have to understand what motivates you to, to do things. Like, what actually motivates you in life? And these are like big, terrifying questions that have no real permanent answers. Um, but what we can look at are like, what are your goals? Um, deciding on goals is very important in you know, everything. So having some goals to work towards is really good. And so when we ask Sarah on this, he says he wants to influence culture through app development. He wants to make cute elves kiss. Uh, and he wants complete dominance over Middle Earth. I mean, I think that these are perfectly reasonable goals. Um, and so the, what, we, what, I, what you would put to him is, you know, can you connect what you're doing to your goals, to your motivations? How can you create those threads? They're going to help you pull through. So for someone like Sauron, you know, he could make a dating app that promotes gender equality and encourages elven makeout sessions. Like, <laughs> this fulfills like two of his three stated goals. These are, these are things that he can use to motivate him through the process of creating a cool app. Yay, Sauron. But obviously, that's a very small part of it. There are lots of different tools you can use to work through motivation problems. Um, there's accountability. Accountability is a really important one, if you're, especially if you're working alone. It can be really, really hard to motivate yourself when you are the only person working on your project. Only you know the amazing, beautiful creature that it can become, and you now see this ugly concrete baby. Um, but you know what it could look like. Nobody else knows. Nobody else is going to help motivate you unless you ask. So Sauron, it's like you can get Saruman to come and check in with him probably weekly and see how things are going. You know, Saruman's pretty chill. He knows that he's probably going to come along. Like he'll bring a few bevies. He'll come over. Like they can sit on the couch. They can talk through like some of the, the problems that the project has had during the week. And Saruman's a busy guy, but, but Sauron knows that at the end of the day, he is actually Saruman's lord and master, and Saruman doesn't have much of a choice. So, you know, very useful. But then, he's, even with this, he's feeling so overwhelmed. He doesn't, he doesn't know what to do. He can't see the light at the end of the tunnel anymore. You know, he's in that awful mid-project grind that goes on and on and on until you just want to die. This is where things like outlines and planning come in very, very handy. Um, whenever I have a problem where I just want to kind of crawl under a desk and sob a bit um, and can't see the light at the end of the tunnel, um, just the process of sitting down and thinking about the things that I have to do and outlining each of the things that I have to do and planning them, how I'm going to do them um, on paper, and, and then maybe even prioritizing them. Despite the fact that you're not actually doing anything, it eases those fears of the unknown, which is essentially a lot of the problem a lot of the time. It's that you don't know, you don't, you're anxious because you're not sure how you're going to do this. And so just like setting down on paper the things that you do know is very reassuring. Even if you don't necessarily know how to do each of those things, just knowing them, having, making them to like known unknowns or known knowns, hopefully, is going to be very helpful and it makes you feel better. So. I feel better now. But Gandalf is so far, much farther ahead than Sar Sar Man, Sauron. So many sour names. Uh, his orc city building sim is almost done. You know, he's, so, he's, he's, he's just, oh, it's so hard. When you're comparing yourself against someone like Gandalf the Grey, let alone Gandalf the White, um, you know, like it's, it's hard and, and this is where you kind of have to learn to start making healthy comparisons. Um, it's pretty unhealthy to take you, who maybe has a couple of 
projects under your belt, you've done a few at work, but you know, you've never done anything really yourself, and compare it to a friend of yours who has released like five different apps over the past six months because they have a problem and somehow they don't sleep. That's an unhealthy comparison and definitely not something that I constantly do with one of my friends. Um, it's really important to look at the people around you and have people around you who are going through the same thing that you are. Um, so Sauron probably shouldn't be comparing himself to Gandalf. Gandalf is a Maya, he's been around for a very long time. Um, you know, and I, from memory, Sauron was asleep for a little while, he had a bit of a nap. And so Gandalf's like streets ahead anyway. Yay! <laughs> um, the other part, which I've conveniently forgotten to have slides for, is um, sometimes when you are stuck, when you don't know what to do, when you're feeling in the pits with a project and you just don't know where to go, it's really important to step away and do something totally fucking different. Um, drop the project for a day, go to the beach, um, climb the caves, uh, or go into the city if you hate shopping and try buying something. Do something that you normally wouldn't do. Um, a, an experience that breaks up your daily routine in a big way. Um, in the compost in the back of your head, the problems that you're having are slowly fermenting. Um, and whether you realize it or not, by sort of switching focus, doing something very different, um, often sometimes that can be a solution. And even if you don't come up with a solution to whatever problem you've got at the time, um, it's often very healthy to take that break, just mentally switch off from that thing for a while, focus on something new, maybe something that makes you very slightly anxious, um, conquer it, go out and buy a pair of pants that you've needed for three months, um, or go to the beach and like, go swimming in the ocean to like here because you hate the ocean and you're terrified of it. Um, these things are very useful. And we all know it, and it's very rare that we do it. And so it is important to remember that when you are having a hard time with something, you can just switch off. You can go do something totally different and come back with a slightly altered perspective. Speaking of problems, what happens when we do have a problem? Um, how do we handle that? How do we handle problem solving? I mean, this is the situation that Lady Gaga's in. She's been waiting on her VR dress for months. It's getting ridiculous. She doesn't know what to do. She's tearing her hair out. She's tearing her wigs apart. You know, like the meat dress is still rotting in the cupboard and, and she doesn't want to think about that right now, but she knows it's there at the back of her mind like a rotting dress would be. The first thing you have to do is ask yourself, is this a problem you have to solve right this minute? Hopefully it won't be. Hopefully it's something that you can just like boop, boop away. But no, the VMAs are next week and Lady Gaga has nothing obscene to wear and this is unacceptable. She has to be the spotlight. So when you've got some, a problem like this where there's a, a time dependent uh, sort of issue, you need to make sure that you're asking the right questions. What is the problem? So for Lady Gaga, look, Katy Perry's VR dress is done. Mine is not, comprende? Very simple, this is the problem. Her project is not done yet and it should be. A very useful technique for this kind of case is to ask why five times. Um, this sounds really dumb, I know it does, but it is helpful, I promise. And you need to drill down and get really specific. Why am I wet? It's raining. Why am I getting wet? I don't have an umbrella. Why don't I have an umbrella? I forgot my umbrella. How can I prevent that? Reminders on my phone. Um, if you start asking these questions and you drill down and you slowly get more specific, um, it can be a very helpful method to start thinking through your problem and to really understand the root of your problem when it's a little bit uh, confused with other issues. So for Lady Gaga, she's struggling with her 3D contractor because she's so slow. And this is unacceptable and clearly, this is a massive production problem and she needs to look at her pipeline. So if you've got a problem with your pipeline, the process by which something gets done, uh, 
you need to kind of like pull it out, look at each of the individual parts of it, under, make sure you understand each of them for one, and then figure out a solution. Uh, so Lady Gaga has a pipeline problem. And no, they're not. But Bjork's one dress was perfect. This is not that. Where's the actual block in this pipeline? But that's, they're slow. There's a problem. OK, so if you've got a problem with a particular worker, for example, a contractor, it's very important to ask them why. Um, Dora is her 3D contractor. Dora is an incredibly skilled 3D artist. She's worked in the industry for 25 years. And she has an incredible eye for detail. So, but in order to do that, she kind of has to have the whole picture, let's say. And apparently, Lady Gaga's concept artist doesn't draw side views, which makes modeling very hard. You need all of the details in order to be able to model something like that. So, what can Lady Gaga do about it? Obviously, she can get the concept artist to do side views. This is a very easy problem to solve, but you can use the same thinking to solve a lot of problems, and it is kind of surprising. And then the important thing is to realize that you need to think about how you're going to actually prevent this in the future. And you, most of the time, it's communication, honestly. Like, it's other people, and it might be your fault, it might be their fault, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. As long as you're talking, things will get done. And so for Dora, we need to make sure that Lady Gaga's asking Dora for her entire requirements before she gets into things. Obviously, this is a hard contract. So Lady Gaga gives Dora the side views. A beautiful VR dress is born. Well done. Yay. The last part of this talk is kind of about motivation. It's about getting feedback and sharing. And that's something that uh, is very hard to do and makes, puts, makes you very vulnerable. And that can be a really scary experience uh, as an independent or as somebody who is uh, doing projects on their own time uh, for themselves. Getting feedback on things is obviously critical. Like It's super important. And it's a thing that we don't often think about during the production process. But it is actually a pretty important part of it. So Thomas, <laughs> his build, is ev it's, everything is broken. And he doesn't want to show it to anyone because it's fucked. And what if the fat controller judges him? Nobody wants that. <laughs> yeah, anyway, the last working build is from like months ago. So what he's got right now doesn't really cut it. <laughs> Always be functional and testable. Um, try to make sure that at the end of each week, what you've got can be opened. It can kind of work in some fashion. You, you should be able to show it at the end of each session. You should not leave the week without a product that kind of you can play with. <clears throat> Additionally, I mean, weekly builds, backups, all very basic stuff, very useful. Um, Sauron is obviously across this. He's highly experienced with backups. Um, but it's hard when maybe you don't have any friends in the industry, you don't know who to go to. For us game developers, testers are kind of weird. Like We don't know who to ask to test our games except for other game developers. And that's fine if game developers are our target market. But a lot of the time, they're not. We're making games for everyone else. Um, and yeah, sure, Like you can show your project to anyone and just ask. Um, most people, uh, there's, a, there's a psychological thing that's worth keeping in mind, um, where if you ask them to do a small favor, um, they will most likely say yes automatically. And then they will actually like you more uh, because they have to justify why they said yes. Um, it's a little bit of a psychological hack. Don't, nobody call me a sociopath. It's not true. Um, in Sauron's case, uh, he can make the orcs test for him. Um, they love romance and sappy bullshit. So um, obviously, this is the path that he's going to go down. The other thing you can do is you can join a group and talk about your problems. Actually, well, I mean, like apart from Lady Gaga, who obviously apparently doesn't have any problems. If we all work together to enact change, we can change everything. Yay! Um, actually, it's really useful. Uh, to have a group of people who are at similar or even differing stages of the project just to come together at the end of the week or month uh, to talk about things. I run a session in the arcade, which is a games co-working space in Melbourne, where every Wednesday for two hours, um, indie devs can come together and we will do kind of like a stand-up and we'll just talk through the problems of the last week and what we're planning for the next week. This kind of thing is super helpful. Um, so to recap, 
Use pre-production to define scope, stick to that scope, and then iterate after you have a product. Get it done, and then play. Make informed decisions by analyzing and trying to reduce as much risk as possible. And find out what motivates you. Be accountable, plan, make healthy comparisons with other developers, um, and align your project with your goals. Make sure that what you're doing is something that you're trying to work towards. And be methodical in your problem solving. Explore and solve pipeline issues and communicate as much as possible. Thank you very much. I do wish I kind of had it finished early because I also have a presentation about the design of Pokemon Go. Will you be four minutes before lunch? Uh, no, it's not enough time. Does anyone have any questions about production or short projects or anything like that? Awesome, that makes my job so much easier. Thank you. Um, thank you all so much for being a fantastic audience, and I will see you later.